What's up, what's up? It's Joey Blush Response, and welcome to the latest episode of Sound and Structure. Today I'm talking to Ivo Ivanov of Glitch Machines, this makers of some of the most radical plugins out there. Let's get right into it. Hi, Ivo. What's up? Hey, what's up, Joey? Thanks for having me on, man. Yeah, man. Excited to talk to you. Same. Um, so this podcast is called Sound and Structure, and we're going to discuss a lot of both. The first thing I'd like to ask you about is for my viewers who don't know you, tell me about yourself. Yeah, sure. So I am the founder and CEO or owner, whatever you want to call it, of the software and sound effects company Glitch Machines. I'm also a musician. I've uh, been making music since the late 80s, started making electronic music in the early 90s. Um, I do a lot of sound design for different companies, including Ableton, Native Instruments. Uh, I have my sounds in a lot of different places. I'm a content provider, so I have sounds up on Splice and in Skywalker Sound and Plugin Boutique and places like that. Uh, so I'm basically an audio guy through and through. I've been doing it most of my life, and I've been a musician most of my life, and uh, that kind of led me to get in more into sound design. And I started the company Glitch Machines about 10 years ago. And... Uh, Basically, this is all I do all day long, every day. Make weird sounds, make music. I'm a, also a modular artist. I've been into modular synth since 2007. Um, and that's basically, in a nutshell, who I am. Thank you for that very thorough description. Uh, <laughs> I remember 2010, uh, and I remember when I used to see glitch machines with your circuit bent devices. Yeah. Um, and those were always really cool. And then you know, suddenly you're making, you're making software that we did one together, um, right. yeah. which was initially the mouthwash and now it's quadrant. Um, right. <laughs> um, yeah. And for, for those of you that, that don't know what he's talking about. So we originally named uh, quadrant scope and in, in, in America, there's a brand of mouthwash called scope. So that's the joke. But, uh, you know, one thing led to another, and it turned out the name was taken by an, an Europe, a European company. I didn't really do my research there, and we ended up changing the name. But it ended up working out because Quadrant is a much cooler name than Scope, I think. <laughs> I have the shirt. I just saw it in my drawer when I was folding my clothes the other day. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, the old shirts, yeah. Yeah. I got to so, get you some new shirts, man. Oh, I would love them. I'll wear them. Whenever gigs come back, I'll wear them. Cool, um, cool. We'll talk about that separately. So, okay. How did you get involved with Snake River Conspiracy? Uh, funny story. So I used to work at, back in the late 90s, I worked at Guitar Center in San Francisco. And this was when it was still in Mission Street at its really old school, shoddy location uh, where we'd have like, you know, a lot of crazy stuff happen just because of where it was located. They later moved the store to Van Ness in a really nice location, like super, you know, high end and everything. So that's why I make that distinction because I worked there in a much different era. Um, anyway, when I worked there, I was the manager of the software and keyboard department. And one of my employees, uh, Jeff Tyson, happened to be an old... Uh, rock star guy from the 80s that he he was in a band called T-Ride and they only had like one album but it was a big success and they toured the you know toured Europe and stuff so they made a bunch of money off that album and then the band fell apart for various reasons but he took the money that he made from that and bought a recording studio in Oakland and basically just shacked up there and was recording for 10 years or something until the money finally dried up and for whatever weird reason that I still can't completely comprehend, he wanted to get a job at Guitar Center so he could get gear for cheaper and make some extra money. <laughs> so he wound up being one of my guys, you know, on the team. And another one of my guys, by the way, was the drummer from MC Hammer. Oh, uh, really? T. Super, yeah, which is bizarre. I had this bizarre, it was a bizarre time. Anyway, um, so Jeff was involved with... Uh, Jason Slater, who was also the co-founder of Third Eye Blind. And Jason was working on this project, Snake River Conspiracy. And they were, uh, he got it signed on Reprise Records and, you know, they had like a video already shot on, on MTV and everything. And, uh, Jeff told me one day, he's like, yeah, I'm going to be going on tour. 
And uh, he was he actually he had already like left Guitar Center at that point because he was getting involved in that project. And so he asked me, he said, we need a keyboard player. Would you be interested in auditioning? And uh, it all kind of happened really quickly. I went to Santa Ro I think it was Santa Rosa. It doesn't matter. But I went to their rehearsal space. And within a couple of days, it was decided that, yeah, I would go on tour and be part of the band. And so we rehearsed for two or three months and then uh, proceeded to go on tour with them. Um, and it was bizarre because it was like, you know, I go from working at Guitar Center to playing huge shows for 35,000 people. It was like bizarre, but it was an incredible experience because building up to that was kind of my goal to be a professional musician. And, you know, as a musician, that's like, the holy grail is to play big stadiums and, and tour and do all that. So I got to do that and, and that's how it all came about. Um, but, you know, then reality set in after that kind of ended because the, the band kind of fell apart too. And then I was going back and working at restaurants and stuff. And that actually is the segue that brought me into sound design uh, because I realized like, okay, I achieved what I wanted to achieve, but like it wasn't exactly what I thought it was going to be. And, and now I'm back to square one, so to speak. Um, so where do I go from here? And that started the, you know, 20 year journey that took me to finally being where I am today with having built a career out of kind of from, from the ground up after that. I feel that man. And what a path. Uh, and I was super into snake river conspiracy when that record came out. So when you told me about that, however long ago I was like, dude, and I listened <laughs> to it again recently. Um, it's a good album. Yeah. It's, it's really cool. It's got really trippy stuff. Like the love song cover with the, the distorted 303 line. Fucking dope. I love playing that live. I had a Nord lead two. I think it was a Nord lead two. Uh, just like on an ultimate a frame on stage. And they put me right like in the front, you know, usually the keyboard player kind of gets tucked in the back, but I was like right on the front stage left or whatever. And, um, it was amazing being able to play those riffs live, you know, on a Nord. And in between tracks, I would sometimes uh, pull up this sub bass patch and I would just, the Nord has this really cool pitch stick. It's like a wooden stick. I would just do these dive bombs and hearing that on a big system in a, like a, you know, big stadium was a mind blowing experience. So that's just a side note, but yeah, it, it was a cool record and a cool time. And I'm, I'm really glad I got to experience that and, and do like the real, not touring in a van with your buddies, but like real tour buses and that, you know, that whole thing. And it was crazy. And you did some stuff like that too in the past. Yeah. Yeah. With Scar the Martyr, which was Joey Jordison of Slipknot's band. Yeah. It was a similar thing. Uh, Reese from Frontline produced the record and Chris Renna did the synths and he, he didn't want to do the tour. And so they were like, Reese, do you know someone? And well, he knew me. So I did that. And then I had a similar experience too, that once it fell apart, uh, my next job was working at Starbucks. So, yeah. so it was like, oh, I was, I was on MTV and now I'm cleaning a bathroom. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. It's a, it's a real humbling experience. Like I'm, you know, signing, I'm sitting in an autograph tent with 400 people waiting to get a, an autograph. And then suddenly I'm making a sandwich at Subway or whatever. It's like, I think a lot of artists have to deal with that. And I think it's even harder for people that have real success that then have to go live kind of a normal life later in life. Uh, Cause at some point, you know, it, it ends or, you know, for most people. And then you have to kind of get acclimated to living a normal life again and not being, you know, the center of attention or whatever it is that, kind of comes with being in that in the limelight and i think that's a difficult process for people you know yeah, so. it's, it's 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 a weird adjustment but you know that kind of ego death i think is is a good thing in the end like you were saying humbling yeah. and humbling maybe is necessary sometimes oh for sure for sure because i think as people in the limelight you are getting thrown way too much you know attention or I don't even know one word can summarize it, but I think people are given way too much, like put up, put up on a pedestal a little bit too much. And many people that aren't equipped with the right kind of, you know, to, mental kind of stability to be able to sort of uh, keep, keep their, their head in the right place through that, let it get to them, 
in bad ways and that can just lead to a lot of issues down the road because their ego becomes way too inflated. <laughs> That's why everyone should try DMT. Um, so, there you go. That's it. Podcast over. <laughs> yeah. Continuing humbling. What are some software tools that you like that are not your own? Um, well, it goes without saying that I would point to the, the most obvious first uh, because it's been the longest running, which is Native Instruments Reactor. Mm. I yeah have loved Reactor since it was called Generator. Actually, back at Guitar Center in the late '90s when it first came out, uh, it was there was really only Retro AS1, <laughs> which is mm -hmm. an old ass you know subtractive software synth. And at the time, it was even then it wasn't that great, but it was like one of the only things that was kind of available. And then Generator came out, and that was like super ahead of its time and uh you know slowly then other things started to vst started to come out and a lot of other things started to become available but uh generator was kind of it and then of course it evolved into reactor and then reactor itself evolved in various ways over the years but i still think if it, if if i had like a desert island plugin kind of thing even though it's more than just a plugin, Reactor would definitely be it. Um, but I like a lot of other small stuff. I like Sonic's, Sonic Charge makes a lot of good stuff. Of course, the Valhalla DSP uh, stuff is phenomenal. The best you know, software reverbs, or at least among the best that I've heard. Uh, I like some other kind of more audio or post-centric stuff that's a little bit less, I don't know how to put it, playful. Um, so for example, like fab filter, they make really good stuff like EQs and you know, everything else. Um, yeah, I use pro Q3 pretty much every day. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's like my go-to EQ as well. Um, I like, a, I mean, I'm, I'm like an audio nerd through and through. So I like, if, if it's good, I like it. I don't really, I'm not one of these people that's like, I'm going to use all my, I use whatever I need to use at a particular moment in time to get a, a certain result, you know, or a certain task done. And I always look for new stuff or things that are inspiring. And actually I like digging through the internet to find weird things that are super obscure and maybe not that many people know about because I'm, I'm a sound designer. So I'm always looking for new resources to make different kinds of sounds. Um, but yeah, those are some of them. And in your display too, like my co-developer for Glitch Machines has his own little boutique brand called uh, In-Ear Display. And he makes a few really great plugins. And his stuff is phenomenal too. So if you guys don't know about that, In-Ear Display is another one to check out. There's, yeah. so much, there's so much good stuff out now. It's kind of hard. Like I, I didn't, I should have prepared a list because I, I want to shout some of these people out, like Freak Show Industries, the guys I'm, I'm wearing the shirt from. Uh, Freak Show Industries are kind of newer. I, I forgot now whether they were with Isotope or one of those other companies, but they're with one of the kind of bigger plug-in companies, and then they split off and started this little small brand that specializes in making bizarre software plugins for sound design, kind of like what Glitch Machines is. And I met them because we... Uh, we're on a similar, uh, we were on the same campaign with Plugin Boutique. They like bundled our stuff together. And so we just emailed and kind of hit it off and just, you know, we're just talking shop. Um, and they're the nicest guys, super talented guys. So, I've, yeah. I haven't so heard of them. Things. You haven't heard of them? No, I'm going to have to check them out. Yeah, definitely worth it. Um, really right up your alley too. I think you'd totally dig their stuff. Their interfaces are super comical and like sarcastic and bizarre. The actual plugins really do sound great and do, a, especially like the kind of fuck shit up type of stuff that I know you and I really like. That's like their specialty. I would definitely check it out. Okay. It's called Backmask. I already like this name. Yeah, there's one and there's a various others. Just check out their, their website. They have great stuff. I will. Um, segueing from that, which Glitch Machines plugin are you most proud of? 
either polygon or palindrome, and I'll tell you why. Um, polygon, because it was my first plugin design that I, I kind of, not to say like any of it is like original ideas at all. I don't think any of our plugins are like things we invented through and through, you know, everybody uses the same sort of structural stuff. We all use LFOs and envelopes and all that. But um, I had never really designed a plugin before when we came out with Polygon like in 2013 or 2014. And so I'm proud of that because it's to this day our most popular plugin. And then we've recently, last year, we actually updated it to version 2.0. So we added a lot of stuff and because it was an older plugin, you know, it had, it needed a real overhaul like through and through. So the code from the ground up was revamped for that. And then I got to kind of go in and add a lot of things that I have learned over the last seven or eight years that uh, made the plugin, make, makes the plugin now a lot more modern than it was. Um, so, so that's the one. And then palindrome, because I think it's a really unique idea. Um, I don't think it's completely unique. I mean, there are some other plugins and software that do things that way in some sense, but again, it was like an idea that I kind of had like just sketched out on a, on a, on my notepad and then it was, it's actually very complex. Like if, if, if you or your listeners know the, the plugin, it's pretty, it's a pretty crazy <laughs> plugin. So yeah. I'm just really, really proud of it because out of all of the things that we've done, it's maybe the most unique. Yeah. You know, I gotta say, I tried palindrome a few times and the, the kind of vector morph plotting thing seemed really cool to me because it was like a next level profit VS in a way, but mm. I haven't, I haven't fully uh, gotten back into it because I haven't used any software VSTs in so long at this point. Yeah, it's, it's, and I think I'm in that same boat. Like, you know, people probably see me post modular stuff all the time and they're like, well, when does he ever use his own, like, doesn't he make plugins? Like, so that's actually uh, something I've been thinking about too, because I do actually use my own plugins and all kinds of software and the computer constantly, but maybe it's not what I, generally post. And I think it's because people tend to gravitate more towards, you know, equipment that they can see and they don't just want to see like screenshots of me on the computer. So that's what, where a lot of that stems from. But to get back to your point, I've been focusing a lot more on the modular lately because I'm kind of on, I don't know, in this weird music renaissance currently where I'm like really inspired to make music again. That's and good. Yeah, and, and the modular just feels like the right platform for me to do that. And we can dive into the modular talk later if you if you want. But Oh, we're going to. Yeah, yeah. But but the 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 main point that I'm trying to make is like um I I I haven't been using plugins as much lately. And um and even with our plugins, I think, you know, it's difficult. Sometimes I don't find myself gravitating towards our own plugins as much because you have to understand how much time goes into developing them and then testing them. You get to a point where it's like, I've really, you know, been submerged in this thing so much that like, I don't know what else is left for me to explore there. Mm -hmm. So it does take some time after a plugin is released before I feel like, oh, let me get back into that and kind of experience that again. So I can't blame you either for not having taken a full kind of ride into what palindrome can do. Cause a it's complex and B it's like, look, you're surrounded by equipment. Mm. I, I know what you mean about the fatigue because I feel that too, even when I do presets for a certain synth, like, you know, for whoever, Mm -hmm. it's like, all right, I did 120 sounds on it and I, I've like tried every which way to make a cool sound that wasn't like the previous 150 sounds I just made. Right. <laughs> and it's like, I never want to touch it again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There is a little bit of that. And that, but, yeah. but then the other side of it too, like for, for us and, and, and in that context, when I'm doing presets for other people, it's very rare that I go back and use the plugin again. Yeah. So in some 
in some circumstances I do though. Like for example, Biome from Unfiltered Audio, oh. which is another company that I, I really like those guys, by the way. Biome is in every track of mine. Yeah, but Biome is one that I use all the time still. And uh, for that matter, a lot of their other stuff. Uh, I should have, see, it just didn't come to me, but I should have mentioned that earlier. Other companies I like, Unfiltered Audio, 100%, one of them. Um, but yeah, it, it's like, I just, you dig in to a point where it's kind of like, what else? I, I'm just, there's nothing else left for me in this realm. But with our plugins, it's different because, well, we, we you know, we made them. So, and plus there's an incentive for me to con continually improve the plugins based on customer feedback and stuff. So it's, I can't abandon them, you know what I mean? In the same way. I'll tell you something funny. Uh, on my album, Void In, the last track is called Timefall. And mm -hmm. there's this kind of crazy atmospheric, sounds like kind of stretching comb filters. Um, and basically what I was doing there is processing the drums in real time with biome. And what, I remember when I was doing the track, I was sitting there like trying to make a biome preset, trying different algorithms, pressing randomize, whatever. And I just couldn't find the right kind of thing. And then I was like, I was like, oh, look, Glitch Machines presets. And I picked the first one, and it was like the right vibe for the track. So <laughs> nice. thanks for that. <laughs> nice. I'm happy to hear that. I actually put a lot of, uh, a lot of effort into those, those uh, presets. Yeah. And uh, I'm glad to hear that, they, that they're useful. That was a fun project. And I just recently talked to those guys. Like, we keep in touch. They're cool guys. Yeah, they're really cool. My camera, I don't know what is up with this webcam. It likes to go out of focus a lot. I just saw that, yeah. I don't know why it does it or what what is going on, but it happens. Um, and, you know, it's, it's it's this, like, really nice Logitech one. It should be better. I don't know. Logitech, uh, come on. Hopefully it'll come, it'll come back. Yeah. Um, so, okay, you haven't been into the software side of things lately. Um, and neither have I. So my next question is, when is Glitch Machines coming out with a piece of hardware? Well, it's a question a that comes up. Yeah, it's a question that comes up a lot. And uh, so, just to kind of rewind a little bit for for the listeners, Glitch Machines was established on hardware. Uh, for the first five years, it was basically me just making circuit bent instruments for people, and I wound up making them for a bunch of famous people which is how the brand kind of got traction. And then I got like review, like my stuff got featured in keyboard magazine and things like that. So, um, but at around 2010, and I'm not going to drag everybody through all the details, but uh, I basically had to switch gears and realize that the brand was valuable enough to continue, but I had to sort of switch gears and make it about sound effects and then eventually plugins. Um, it just wasn't feasible for me to continue making circuit bent instruments in a business kind of context because the instruments themselves were becoming more and more scarce because they're based on old 80s and early 90s, like learning toys and toy keyboards. So at some point, you know, they're going to be either gone or get, they're getting way, way too expensive to justify as like the base cost for one of these things based on what I had to sell them for. So long story short, um, over the years, being kind of a synth head and especially into modular, I've gone through the whole gamut of what can I do to get a, a module built? numerous times. And I happen to uh, be fortunate enough to know a lot of the main guys behind, you know, all the modular companies, all the, the big ones, at least. Uh, so I've had the opportunity to have the conversations about what it would take. And my biggest hesitation is that I don't have the, the infrastructure to really support a module. I could probably, we could design one and then work with a company like Qubit or somebody like that that seems like it would be a kind of a good fit to work with uh, us on a, like a collaborative sort of thing. 
and then have have them sort of take the strain of how to deal with distribution and repairs and everything else. Uh, that could work. But then at the end of the day, you have to ask, like, what's really, what's Glitch Machines bringing to the table? Let's take it just as a, for, for the sake of example, in, in the context of Qubit. They do a lot of digital modules like the Data Bender and the Prism and, you know, all the other stuff that's coming out. They just had the Cascade envelope out and they're coming out with the Aurora Reverb. And it's all stuff that's kind of, and, and of course, all the modules prior to that. It's all stuff that kind of fits into the realm of what we do. So it would seem like a really good pairing. But then, you know, looking at it more from a less romantic and more business kind of centric perspective, what are we really bringing to the table since they can already do all these things without us, right? And, you know, then the conversation that keeps coming up is, well, why don't you guys port some of your plugins, like Fracture even, or something like that? That's my like first that. thought. Yeah, and that, you know, that seems like the logical thing to do, but if you really look at what Fracture is, it's basically a less elaborate data bender, <laughs> right? So it starts to kind of be like, well, what are we really bringing that's new? It, it, if, if you want my opinion, I should have jumped into modular 10 years ago. That would have been a better time to kind of jump into it. And then at, the, at, at this point, we would be more on the level of IntelliGel or some, something like that, where it's like we have a, a whole history of, you know, releases and modules and the, the business, business stuff will have been sorted out by then. But to jump into it now, I would have to really find the right circumstances that I can't clearly see at present what those would entail. Um, to do it ourselves completely would be completely unrealistic because I don't have the facilities. Uh, sure, I could probably team up with somebody like Dark Place and they could make the module for us and then I could get a couple people on board to do assembly and we could figure out the distribution. But then it's like that that all costs time and money and effort. And, you know, how do I deal with things like returns and repairs? That's a big aspect of the modular business people don't consider. Anytime you have a piece of hardware that has to get plugged into electricity, it's a huge liability. It also entails getting uh, commercial liability insurance and all kinds of other expensive things that people don't understand or know about. And once you start looking at all of that, then it becomes a lot less attractive as an, you know, an endeavor than just sticking with what I've already got going, which is making plugins and sound effects and kind of continuing on that path. That's absolutely not to say that I wouldn't love to have the opportunity to make a Glitch Machines piece of hardware, maybe not even a module, but it's not as seamless or easy as I think some people feel or think that it is. You know what I mean? What are your thoughts on it? So what I'm getting from you is Fracture XT Euro Rack Q4 2021. Let's do it. <laughs> uh, well, I, I understand the, uh, the hesitation to the hardware side and all the headaches that come with it, but you know, uh, the what what I would think of for you is when I look at something like uh, like make noise with the sound hack modules or yeah, yeah. or 4ms with the Matthias Matthias Puich Puich. I'm sorry yeah. if I'm butchering your name, um, but you know, like you could do a custom algorithm for someone. Like this is the module. This is it. You know, something that hasn't been done before. Um, yeah, I thought of that too. But the you know, and my answer to that is. I don't have any proprietary algorithms and uh, we as glitch machines don't really have DSP or anything that's proprietary that we've developed. And that's because we don't, we're not scientists, you know, we're musicians. And so we kind of, and I have an audio engine, a formal audio engineering education and degree um, and a lot of experience in audio, but I don't, no DSP mathematics and, you know, some of those things that you need to have under your, or in your toolkit, so to speak, to be able to develop code or, you know, DSP or algorithms that are unique. And that's why I say 
we don't really have anything to bring to the table that nobody else has. The guys that are already out there making the modules or that we would bring the code to could probably do the same thing that we could do. And that's, that's why I'm like, well, if we had that, if I had a physics, you know, PhD on staff that could develop some crazy new thing that would be exclusive to us, then yeah, absolutely. I could be like, hey, Qubit, we got this crazy DSP thing. Nobody else has it. We developed it. It's taken two years and here it is. We want to make a module with you guys. And this is like our contribution to that. I think that's the sort of hypothetical scenario that everybody imagines. And I get it. Like if that was a thing, 100%, I would have done it by now. But it's not programming that kind of DSP is not a trivial task. You actually need to have physics people and mathematicians on staff that are, it's like, you know, most companies that are developing stuff like that have those people on board. And glitch machines can't support somebody with 150,000 K a year salary, you know, that would necessitate that kind of income to be on board with us to develop that kind of code. It's just not there yet. Maybe it will be in five or 10 years. And at that point, it will open up all those doors. I would love to make a synth, you know, modular. Sure. Like that's great, but I would love to make an actual box or, you know, keyboard or something. And that's really where I see the future of the company. That's why I'm also not really stressed about like, how are we going to make modules or hardware? Cause I think that's all coming. Glitch Machines has grown substantially in the last 10 years. And I'm not planning on going anywhere. So what can happen in the next 10 years? I think it's it's growing exponentially now. And that will afford us a lot of opportunities over the next 5 or 10 years that could definitely lead into territory of becoming one of the bigger companies out there that, you know, may not be Ableton or NI, but getting, you know, approaching that. And once that happens, I'm open to, I'm an entrepreneurial person. So I'm not going to be closed off to trying new things or pursuing different endeavors in this realm, but it has to be under the circumstances that will allow us to maintain everything that's currently going on and, and keep moving forward and not get inundated by this all or nothing kind of thing that could fall apart. And then, you know, everything I've worked for has kind of been compromised. I can't do that. I feel that for me, I, I just really like your aesthetic. And I think uh, less so the functionality. I think your aesthetic is something that could lend itself well to your rack more even as a, and not even your rack, just hardware, like as an art piece. Like if you do like, you know, we're making a hundred glitch boxes and that's it. Boom. Mm -hmm. You know, that kind of thing. But speaking of the future, um, what's next on the map for glitch machines, if you're willing to share? Yeah, sure. I have some stuff I can't talk about in a lot of detail, but uh, right now we're still working our way through updating all of the plugins. Um, we have 11 plugins now, and that's counting two free ones. And over the last couple of years, we've been working on revamping the plugins. Um, as technology kind of goes, the thing about software that's different than hardware is hardware is kind of like, it is what it is at the time that it's released. And then in these days, like you get firmware updates and stuff, but the hardware is what it is. You're not going to be able to do much with it. With plugins, on the other hand, as technology continues to evolve, I'm, I'm sure, obviously, I'm I'm preaching to the choir, everybody already knows about this, but just to kind of set the tone for what I'm trying to say is software constantly has to get uh, re revamped in order to stay modern, not only functionally, but also aesthetically and stuff like that. So we've been working through that uh, over the last couple of years and we're getting pretty close. We have three plugins left to update. Um, and in between, we also released a new plugin called Tactic which is kind of like a generative drum machine type of thing. Um, the I next think thing I that, that one that was the one we just recently released. I think you you remember it. We talked about it briefly. I sent it to you. I I fried my brain, man. 
<laughs> Don't worry. Don't Way worry. Too many uh, things have been in here. <laughs> yeah, I, I know the feeling. Um, anyway, yeah, we so we we basically released tactic because we wanted to just uh, we 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 realize that it's kind of a slog to get through these updates and asking people to be very patient because people want to see something new. Um, it, with as many people as obviously appreciate all the updates and the efforts that are going into making the plugins that exist already better, I think a lot of also, other people also want to see new stuff. So we released Tactic for those, for those people that were kind of ready for that. Um, and we also wanted to create a plugin that was a little bit less elaborate than some of our other stuff and make it a little less expensive and just more to the point to kind of focus on a specific task and not make it too crazy because tactic could have easily been another cataract or something even crazier. And that's the thing that we always have to do is to sort of say like, where does, where does it end? You know, uh, that's the most difficult aspect of creating, creating a plugin, I think is to say like, enough is enough or to know when to draw the line. But anyways, um, so next thing we're going to do is release fractures update, which is our free plugin. It just needed a new user interface, which is now scalable. And it's, it got cleaned up a lot. The code was very old. The code preceded polygon it was actually fracture was actually our first plugin, but it was uh, part of this whole collaborative thing that I did with Antonio Blanca and uh, and Thomas, who was in your display, and myself, and we released it as a thing called uh, Fragment. And then, I uh, remember. yeah, and that eventually became Fracture. Um, but that code really needed to get cleaned up. So we're in the process of doing that. I think that should be out within a few weeks. Uh, obviously, it'll be a free thing still. We're not going to suddenly start charging people for it. And after that, we're, we're diving into Cataract 2.0. Cataract is probably one of uh, the most obscure plugins because at the time that we made it, I was really <laughs> kind of in this mindset like, why should we have to conform to how everybody does things? We should just go with our ideas and just uh, make it obscure and complex if that's what it you know, what we feel that it requires. And that's what it became. It, all of the parameter labels are kind of abbreviated and obscure, and it's not very easy to get around until you kind of understand how it works. And at the time, I thought that was really punk rock, you know. But after five or six years of tech support questions about the same five things, I realized, <laughs> you know, it may, it may not be worth it. <laughs> And so we're we're completely revamping that thing uh, in the same way that we did with Polygon, perhaps even more so, um, to just modernize it in every in every way, both with the interface and functionality and backend code and all of that. So that's next, and then uh, we just have a couple left. Quadrant, which is our sort of modular plugin effects processor, and Cryogen um, are both getting updates, and then after that. You know, we're going to start on a project that, again, I can't really talk about in a lot of detail, but it's going to be more than a plugin. Um, it's going to be an app, and it's going to be uh, geared towards sound design, the type of sound design that, like, you know, we sort of like, <laughs> if for lack of a better term. It won't be like a wave lab, you know, mastering kind of thing. It'll be like make weird sounds kind of app. Oh, like a... Uh, sound hack or Aguirre Fontes liar, that kind of vibe. More. That kind of vibe, exactly. Just our put, putting our spin on an environment for sound design that's a standalone app. I like that. I'm very curious. Um, please do send that my way uh, when the time comes. Oh, well, you, you're going to get everything anyway, so that goes without saying. Oh, love you, buddy. <laughs> love uh, you too. So, okay. So that's what's going on, yeah, with, with Glitch Machines. I mean, at this point, my focus is just on keeping... It's grown so much, and we have a, a massive user base uh, worldwide. The free stuff has been downloaded 
I think 600,000 times a pop now each, you know, and that's a lot for us. Uh, we get, you know, quite a bit of web traffic a month. I mean, for us, these are big numbers. So my, my main focus is just to keep this going and to keep growing it. The company has grown every year. The brand is becoming more and more recognizable every year. We're making more money every year. So it's like, yeah, hardware is definitely on the horizon, but it's not a priority right now because I don't want to derail from what's going on now. To just to be able to make an income to support two families and my creative endeavors and not have me stress out to have to release something just to pay our bills is a huge accomplishment in and of itself. And I, I don't want to compromise that by taking the wrong turn. So it's mostly just keep, you know, stay stay true to my path and kind of keep that going right now. That's what's going on with glitch machines. I, I think it sounds all good to me. You don't need to change anything personally. <laughs> um, cool. So that's, that's Evo, the software maker. Let's talk about Evo, the musician. Cool. Um, your modular is bigger than mine. It makes me jealous. <laughs> Not much, though. I think they're pretty much the same size systems when you factor it all in. I, I, I like that we both have the monster case. <laughs> yeah. I thought you had two for some reason. I'm tripping lately. Um, but speaking uh -huh. of that, uh, what's, what are you really digging right now in your system? I love the NerdSeek. Um, I saw you had <clears> two of them. Yeah, I have two of them. The reason why I like it is because having been into modular for so many years, one of the biggest drawbacks was to really be able to create elaborate arrangements. You could definitely pull it off. I mean, there, especially with now where there are other options as well as the nerd seek, there are numerous other sequencers that will take you there. But for a long time, there really weren't any sequencers where you could do multiple parts and different song structures and stuff. And uh, so, you know, I would, that would kind of drive my stuff either into the territory of kind of making music with the modular alongside a lot of other gear to kind of fill in those gaps and other equipment that would sequence the modular. Or it would just be on the modular making weird sounds. And that, that was cool too. For a long time, the modular was really just a source for making weird sounds for me. But in the back of my mind, I always wanted to do more with it. And the NerdSeek makes that possible now. I've, I've been able to make extremely elaborate arrangements, um, which, have, which has brought me into this whole different kind of realm of Eurorack. Now I don't really see the system as a source of making weird sounds as much, although I still do quite a lot of that too for a lot of the projects that I work on. But now it's like a legitimate music writing platform for me. A music easel, if you will. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it has its limitations, as you well know. I mean, it's there's there are a lot of limitations you have to dance around when it comes to hardware, and especially modular. Um, it does somewhat inform the music that I make, like the music I make in with software is substantially more elaborate or complex or whatever, and it's and inherently different. But what I like about making music on the modular is that it's more raw and more real. I don't sit down and think about what genre. And if, for those of you that may be familiar with my stuff that I post, you notice like there's, influences in there from psychedelic trance or break beats or drum and bass or industrial or all the different kind of genres that I like make their way into my music that I make on the modular as where if I sit down and, and start making music in Ableton Live or something, it usually goes in a specific direction that's different than that. And, and that's what I don't like as much. That's why I prefer making music on the modular because I feel it's more raw, it's more visceral, it's more real, and it's more spontaneous in the sense that like I just create whatever I create. I feel that that's the main reason 
I do my music the way I do too. It's like that I want it to be a, an expression of myself and less so the kind of protracted experience of putting a song together, the DAW, you know, waiting for the drop to come and all this kind of stuff. I just want it yeah. to be like a meditation. Um, right. Right. And for me also, I've been kind of going backwards technology wise. Like, all right, I went into the modular. I was like direct connection. Then I was like, okay, but I've been mixing on the computer and arranging on the computer. I don't want to do that. So then they, we're talking like 10 years here. So then it's like, okay, now yeah. I'm going to do these tracks live multi-tracked and just use the computer as like a tape machine. Okay. Then I'm getting away from that. And it's like, why am I multi-tracking? Why don't I just mix it all in the machine? <laughs> you know, right, then it's, right. and then now it's like buy a, a Porta studio record to cassette and like, why am I using a computer? And it's, it's this kind of, it's almost like a research in a way because I never had the chance to work in those approaches that, you know, mm -hmm. uh, other people did. So it's, it's more like understanding the way things worked um, back then to, to influence mm -hmm. the way it's done now. That's, that's what it is for me. Um, like I was talking to Ram from Phoenicia mm -hmm. and, oh man, I lost my train of thought. Uh, Doing things the way that they, yeah, go ahead. Samplers, samplers. Mm -hmm. He was talk I was asking him like, what are you using? What'd you use on Brownout and all that? And and it's mm -hmm. like samplers and they would just record the synths through the eventide or whatever and then sample that and then put that through Morphex. And then I realized like, okay, samplers evolved into computers because samplers were a way of archiving sound, almost mm -hmm. like your patch memory for things you could not have. You know, mm -hmm. and I, I, I had to use old samplers to understand that. And I think a, a lot of people in my age group have, don't have any reference to that. So it's, it was an interesting path to go down and romplers and whatever else. Um, and, yeah. And that, that's a good point that you make because like, I mean, we're, we're not that far apart in age, I don't think, but I, I, I'm a bit older than you. So I think like when I was in my teens, first starting this stuff, it was a different time. And like back then there were no plugins, you know, you yeah. couldn't, you could, couldn't even track on the computer. Um, so all you could really use the computer for was MIDI sequencing and everything else was done in hardware. So I, every, myself and all of my audio friends, we all had similar studios, you know, all hardware based. You just have your little computer that is running like Cubase or something just for MIDI. And then everything is, you know, in synth racks and keyboards and a big, usually you have 24, 32 channel console with everything plugged in. You have hardware compressors and you know, like a real, I mean, home studio still, but all hardware based and working in that domain. Um, yeah, it does not only necessitate a different approach, but it gives you a different kind of perspective on uh, music creation and, and sound and everything else. And I, I'm glad that I had that backdrop uh, as, you know, experience to kind of lead me toward more software oriented stuff and then back into hardware it's what I also like about the modular is that it does. It's a more tangible way of making, creating sounds and making music and expressing yourself uh, than, than I think a screen. Although I'm not one of these people that's like very religious about hardware either. So there are a lot of people, for those of you that don't know that are like, I, j I hate computers. I just want to get away from computers. And that's why I got into modular. I'm not one of those people at all. I love computers, you know, uh, but I also recognize that creating on the computer and sitting down in front of a screen and typing stuff out, even if you have a keyboard, is a very different experience than digging into the system with modules and, you know, all these kind of quirks and working with hardware samplers is different than working with uh, software samplers. I love hardware samplers and I had all the, you know, EMU, E6400, E4XT, S5000, S6000, the Yamaha S3000. And I mean, just ESI32, I can't even name them all, but I had every imaginable piece of gear over the years. Maybe we should talk about gear too. Oh, we're, uh, we're going to get to that. I got questions for you. <laughs> yeah. You but, <laughs> but, you know, working with, with hardware samplers, I really missed that once I got, more into the computer realm and there were many years in in there between starting with hardware and then kind of going back to hardware now where I didn't touch hardware samplers and I think it really changed my approach 
how, how I use samplers. One of the biggest fun, kind of funny jokes that was sort of a thing in the audio world for a while was that software samplers don't even sample. So how are they samplers, right? And the, the premise is that, well, this, the computer can already record. So that's where you're doing the sampling. Then you just import the audio and deal with it in the sampler. But it's like samplers were always about literally sampling. You're plugging something into this piece of hardware, recording it, and then editing it out and kind of figuring out how to do whatever you're trying to do with it. But it was always about recording. And that was what was missing from sampling for so long. Some companies are starting to recognize that, like Electron, by implementing sampling into like the analog rhythm or two and all that. I'm going to be that guy and say, I think it sounds different. And I also wonder... Um, in terms of old samplers, like, you know, I'm talking 80s, like Emacs, old, old, yeah, to, yeah. you know, Mirage, whatever. This sure. is before we had a common audio format. Like every sampler now is WAV files, for mm -hmm. example. You know, mm -hmm. so I don't, I don't know the technology that we're using then, but I would imagine it was something proprietary to encode the audio. So my assumption is, is that when you record audio into one of those old samplers, even the encoding process alone affects the sound. I don't know how much truth there is to that, but I know they sound different, you know? Yeah, and I don't, I, 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 I won't pretend to know that much about it either, but it has to do with the converters too, a lot, you know? Oh yeah, for sure, yeah. Um, that was what, like with the, you, you mentioned the Mirage, which is such a nightmare to work with, by the way, but it does have some old school kind of nostalgia attached to it. Um, I had one at one point, mm. and that thing was a bear to, to work with because it just had the little... LCD kind of display. It didn't even have like a character, you know, or like a full LCD where you could see the waveform. So everything was done by ear. It's hexadecimal, but, right? Yeah, I don't, I, I don't remember exactly, but it was one of those little like LED screens, not LCD. Like it was literally just numeric. Like there's no, you know, way of displaying a waveform or anything like that. Awesome. Um, but what my point was is what gave that thing its gritty character are the converters. It's not even a, a matter of how it dealt with the files or the software. It's actually literally just how shitty the converters were or what, mm. give, what give it its sound. I mean, I definitely think that's true, but I think also the way it handles stuff like transposition because, um, like, for example, with my Emacs, to transpose the pitch of this, this sample, mm -hmm. it has a variable sample rate across the whole keyboard. It's not... A fixed sample rate system. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, uh, absolutely. Yeah, the interpolation that changes a lot. Most definitely, yeah. Stuff like that, interpolation and old samplers, and that's why we don't implement. It's actually funny you bring this up because that's why we didn't implement things like, uh, you know, like time stretching and time compression into Polygon because I like the sound of the way that the audio files kind of start artifacting and getting weird once you start to deviate from the root pitch and stuff. I like that about old samplers. And yes, you're right. Like the very various different ways that they would approach that in software did have a different uh, effect and di differentiated the way that these things sounded. So it's not just the converters, but anyway, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm into old stuff like that too. Big time. So, What gear do you wish uh, you could have again? Like, what have you gotten rid of and that you miss? I've gotten rid of way too much stuff. Um, and I, in one, in one sense, it's great because I've had the opportunity to get my hands on a lot of equipment. I'm talking like a lot of equipment because I started buying gear in like 88 or 89. Uh, and at that time it was guitar gear, but I had like a JCM 900 half stack and a quadroverb and, a, you know, wireless Nady and all this, like I had a ton of stuff for my age, you know, at the time. Um, but I have been buying gear and, and unfortunately also selling it since those days. And luckily now I have a really healthy relationship with equipment. I don't sell stuff anymore. I keep everything I buy. But for many years it was like, buying something and then selling it to buy the next thing, you know. Through that process, I've had an incredible amount of equipment. The first keyboard I bought was the Chord Prophecy in 1995. Got one here, nice. Oh, awesome. See, that's one that I miss a lot. 
Um, I don't know how it is anymore. I've heard samples of it online and stuff on YouTube, but so it's, I don't know if it's mostly just nostalgia or if it is still pretty badass little synth. I think it is. I, I remember it as being very odd once you start digging into the physical modeling stuff. And I love the little pitch stick ribbon thing that it has. Um, but I love that little synth at the time. And I also bought a JP 8000 a year later. Uh, Roland JP8000. I really like that thing because it had the ability to store sequences on a per key basis. So you could have like, I don't remember how many steps, but like 16 or 32 step sequences and then store those on each key and then trigger them sequentially. And so I had the whole key bed filled with sequences and I still have a cassette that I recorded of all the little riffs that I made. I love that thing. Oh, I'd love to hear that. I'll, yeah, I'll share it with you. I have it. I, I have it on my hard drive here. I listen to it from time to time because it's like inspiring to hear my old ideas. Uh, I've had every imaginable Waldorf synth until they went out of business and then got acquired and kind of went back into it. So <clears throat> I miss the, all the microwave stuff. I had the microwave one, the microwave two, the microwave XT, the XTK, the Q, the micro Q, you know, and so on. Um, but the Waldorf stuff, I really, really like. The Nord modular is probably the one that I miss the, the most. Yeah. Because I think, you know, the kinds of sounds that you could get out of that thing were the most exciting to me. Out of, you know, anything in that era, at least. Followed closely by the Waldorf stuff. Um, but... That's just some some of the stuff that comes to mind. I would literally, I would be a spreadsheet a mile long if I went through all the stuff that I've had and and you know sold and regret. Because I, I mean, it's not just synths, right? It's like I've had unending amounts of reference monitors and mixers and outboard equipment and processors and computer stuff and you know everything else. So the stuff I missed the most was the st early stuff from the from the nineties, like the stuff that I just listed. What's in your electronic setup current day today? Um, so for hardware and for synths and stuff, I have a pretty big modular system. Um, and then I just I just bought an analog rhythm Mach two again. Black one, so jealous. Yeah, the black one. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I bought an analog rhythm when they were first released, as well as the analog four. And before that, I had, you know, the older, I've, again, total embarrassing gear nerd. Like, I've had every electron box that's been released. Me too, though. I feel you. Yeah. <laughs> you're, and that's why we have so much in common, because we're like, I, you're one of the few people I know that's just as bad as me. Um, but, yeah, so I have that. And the reason why I got that is because I just wanted to have one of those boxes again. Just like with the modular, I think it, like having the ability to sequence drums sort of independently and then sort of build stuff around that is a different approach than maybe how I would normally do things. So it's really an interesting creative platform for me and a nice kind of way to integrate some different types of sounds into the modular. Although I can do drums really well with the modular by itself. So it's not really that it was necessary so much as that I just wanted it. <laughs> I also like the idea of dragging it upstairs when my family's just chilling so I can make stuff on it without having to be down here because my studio is here in the basement in my house. And that means that I have to come down here to do anything and dragging the modular up isn't really realistic because my cases are too big. So that's the stuff that I have there. And then um, I have some Genelec monitors. I just bought an Apollo uh, X6 interface. I had a Lynx Hilo before that and it died for the third time. So I just finally pulled the plug on it. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, just too, you know, too, too many repairs and issues with it. It sounds amazing. But that thing heated up like a toaster. I mean, honestly, like burn your finger style, like hardcore. Okay. So I don't know what kind of components they're using in there or whatever. And, and it was like, it's a standalone box. So there's nothing sequestering it or there's no, you know, I'd have even a fan pointed at it. And the thing is just a complete toaster oven, you know, hot, hot, hot. So I think that contributed a lot to the components failing over time and 
I finally just pulled the plug on it. I love the Apollo. It sounds great. It has more I.O. options. It has preamps and stuff, which the Lynx Hilo doesn't have mic preamps, which is another big fault that it has, I think. Um, and uh, I have an S88 Mach 2 controller from Native Instruments, which is nice to have because uh, I, I don't really play piano anymore, but I did play piano for a number of years when I was a kid. And my kids are, have been taking piano lessons for five years, and I'm actually giving my daughter audio lessons once a week. That's cool. Um, yeah, it's really been amazing. And having the keyboard was mostly a product of that because I wanted her to feel comfortable in the studio and make that kind of bridge that gap between playing on the piano and playing soft synths and stuff a little bit, you know, make that a little easier. Um, but that's kind of it. I, I, you know, have pared it, pared things down to the bare necessities. Like I, I look at your studio, for example, and I'm just like super interested in everything that you have. Cause it's like, <laughs> you know, all stuff that I've either had or wish that I had over the years. And at some point when I come visit you in Berlin, we're going to have to jam. Dude, I'm a hundred percent down. Cool. Um, cool. I wanted to hack your brain with one piece that I don't know if you've heard of, you probably have, but uh, I think it's, one for you. Okay. <laughs> Do you know this? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen it. I haven't actually played with one. Oh, man. <laughs> Did you just pick that up? Uh, no, I've had it for for quite a while now, like maybe almost a year. Um, okay. I did just get it back from repair, though, because I was... I rewired my studio quite recently and I don't know how or what the fuck I did, but somehow I fucking broke the, the power adapter and like broke the plastic piece. Oh, good times. Yeah. So uh, I had to get that fixed. I had like a series of broken shit. My, my case failed. We were talking about Yeah, yeah, and yeah, my, yeah. My, then my army fireface died uh, like a few days after. So I'm, no I'm talking to you on a Behringer interface right now. It sounds fine though. Yeah. Uh, sounds good from here. So I'm I'm getting the RME repaired. Um and then yeah, this Gotherman broke. I guess bad things come in threes, so I guess done. <laughs> hope, yeah, hopefully. The, there's nothing worse to me than studio shit like this, like things breaking. And uh, two years ago my, my computer just completely took a shit on me and it turned out to be a two and a half month fiasco. Oh my god. So when that happens, it's like everything comes to a screeching halt because this is what we do for a living, like you know. It's like, so I hear you, man, but that would be cool to check that thing out. I, I'd love to, well, speaking of which, so I'm, things with COVID are obviously still really weird, but next year we will be coming to Berlin around Superbooth and we're actually going to get an Airbnb and be there for a month. We're fucking um, hanging, man. So we're going to hang a lot. We're going to do, I hope we can do some shows together even. And we'll, we'll really try to maximize our time together. I'd love to talk to you separately about that and plan some stuff. Cause I think it makes perfect sense. Plus I'd love to just hang out. We're definitely going to um, hang. That sounds really cool. Yeah, cool. Uh, so I'll tell I'm you excited. more about that, more, more about that separately. And when that happens, we'll definitely dive into some of this stuff that you got there. Cause you gotta, I love all the stuff. Just since we're on the subject, I love all the stuff that you post. And it's it's like I've had over the years a little bit of trouble kind of putting myself in the limelight. Um, but you always inspire me to, to do more of that and to get out there more and show what I'm doing. Because I love everything that you do and you're a super talented guy. And oh, your, thank studio, you, your studio is badass. So it's just cool to know you. <laughs> well, thanks. Um, for the audience... Evo and Glitch Machines were the first company to to notice me and bring me on board to do any kind of professional sound work. So I got to say thanks for that, man. I'm here now because of you. Yeah, <laughs> so <laughs> awesome, man! Awesome, yeah. Um, Dream Gear. Dream Gear. I've always wanted a Waldorf Wave. Um, of course, now it's like, well, we have the Quantum and. and you know, technically it's probably capable of more, but if I, if, if I could just snap my fingers and have something appear here, it would be a brand new Waldorf wave. Max. There's out. a red one for sale right now on Vemia. Is there? Yeah. 
I've seen them over the years for sale. I just, it's not that I can't afford it. It's just, you know, bringing in an old school piece of gear like that definitely comes with its issues and that, you know, getting things repaired that are older like that becomes more and more difficult. So I tend to gravitate away from getting, even though the Waldorf is less vintage than a lot of other things, um, getting any kind of vintage gear, I've been kind of like too sort of what's the word I'm looking for hesitant too hesitant to pull the trigger on because of all the potential issues that could go along with it because there are a lot of you know I'd love a CS80 I'd love a lot of old stuff that everybody would love you know the typical top 10 list that you hear people I, we probably want a lot of the same things you but, and I but what is it because we're talking dreams here not realistic yeah okay well uh, again, I, if if we're talking dreams, I would love to have a Waldorf Wave, brand new, mm -hmm. in a box. Uh, CS80, give me, give me some more. CS80, uh, le, let me let me think. It's kind of hard to think off the top of my head because it, it's it's funny because I've had <laughs> I've had most of the gear that I would want. Uh, mm -hmm. So I don't know if we're talking dream as in like completely you know unattainable expensive stuff. I'd love to have a. a Brand new in a box, old. Uh, God damn it! What's the the name of it now? I'm completely drawing a blank. The old sampler with the green screen with the Fairlight. Little, yeah, the, I'd, I'd love to have a brand new Fairlight because I'm into all those '80s electronic sounds. And actually, back in those days, like uh, you know, the music that I was listening to as a kid was mostly because I was really intrigued by the sounds. So even like old pop stuff, you know, Michael Jackson or whatever, was like the sounds that I was interested in, all the drum machine sounds. I'd love to have a, a you know, some of the old, like a, a an authentic Lindrum or, you know, some of those old drum boxes because um, I just love all those old sounds. Uh, but I can't think of anything that would be like, oh, that's impressive. He wants one of those. Like, I think it's partially because my mind is no longer in that state where I'm like lusting for equipment. And I really had to work to get there because that's, that was my default for many, many, many years is like, mm, gear, me too. Gear, 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 gear. Yeah. yeah. So now I'm kind of more like mentally focused on creating and the gear isn't as much of a driving force, like behind my passion. But I'm still a gearhead, so it's kind of weird. Like, I'm totally, I st already have my plan of what I'm going to buy next January because I kind of buy my stuff uh, annually in January because of tax reasons and stuff. So I already have my list of things that I'm going to be buying. Uh, so it's not like I'm not interested in equipment, but I just don't have like something in the back of my mind that I wish I could get. Mm. Maybe, maybe that sounds boring, but that's the, that's the truth. <laughs> No, that's that's a perfectly valid answer. I'm here for your answer, no matter what. Um, cool. I was talking with Orfix uh, a couple podcasts ago, and my answer to that was the ARP 2500 and then like an old Buchla 200 and a new 200D. But one I thought of quite recently, which I don't think you've mentioned, is the, the FISMO. You ever the had FISMO, one? Yeah, I had a FISMO. The FISMO is rad. That thing for wavetable sense, it's still to this day sounds super unique. And I have to be honest, I think it's a corny name and it even looked corny, but the sounds, man, were out out completely out of the bounds of anything else that was around. Even the Waldorf stuff at the time, like I think the FISMO sounded even cooler. And for that matter, the FS1R too, mm. um, which is a, a Yamaha kind of wavetable synth that you you may have or know about no i have the new version okay there's a there's a new version it's called the mod x oh it's, cool okay. it's the fs1r eight operator engine you don't have the format shaping side of things but mm -hmm. you have an awm sample engine you can load and you can layer them and you can have eight fs1rs in one patch basically oh crazy okay I on top of that. crazy effects and stuff i did a there's a performance video of, of me and a drummer, a Yamaha endorsed drummer, and I'm playing with the Mod X and my modular, and it's got some crazy sounds. 
Okay, I need to get up to speed on that because that, that's totally new to me, new information to me. But yeah, the FS1R was a cool FM kind of thing. And then the FISMO was obviously an awesome wavetable synth. I'd love to have a FISMO. I'd also love to have my <laughs> Invisible Shadow Microwave XT again because mm. uh, I had them twice and sold them twice. I've okay. actually had six Microwave XT racks and I've had uh, the, I've had seven modulars but you know keyboards racks micro modular like all the different variants and this is all times that i bought it sold it bought it again sold it bought it again sold it i've had you know every waldorf synth probably three or four times over that's <laughs> feel you man <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> that's like my fourth Nord modular back there <laughs> yeah exactly it's like <laughs> that's just how it goes sometimes but um yeah, I'd love to have like a sandwich Sid again, uh, or even the Shruti one. Those were like all uh, pre-mutable instruments, modular boxes that were really cool. Uh, the chip in the sandwich Sid is the Yamaha FM chip that you oh, have yeah. in the uh, in the Akimi's Taiko and Akimi's Castle. I think it's the same chip. Okay, it's not a Sid chip. Excuse me. You're right. That's the sandwich Sid. Yep. And then I'm thinking of the FM, the OP one. Uh, it's the same. It's like the same project by the same people, but they had the one with the the FM chip from okay. Yamaha. I'm not familiar with the sandwich Sid, so I don't know the name of the uh, other one. I think it's the sandwich FM or something obvious like that. Anyway, hmm. it, it's yeah. It made it's it's made by the same people. And then you basically get the kit and build it yourself and you, you get the chip. There's a SID chip one and then the OP chip one. And the, the OP one was the one I was actually talking about that has the same kind of chip that the ALM modules have. Nice. Um, there are a lot of things I'd love to have back, but what's, you know, at this point it's like, I'm just trying to look forward and see what I can, what I can do going forward. Because it's, it's easy to get trapped in nostalgia, I think. I feel that. And speaking to that, um, you've been through quite a few Eurorack setups. Um, what led you to this setup you have today? Um, because obviously, it, you know, there's a lot of trial and error with building a system. Oh, yeah. Um, I remember you had one of all phono genes at one point. <laughs> yeah. yeah um, but, but now you have like what looks to me like a very feature complete system, and it's also quite well thought out. Um, maybe we'll have, I'll get a picture and put it right on, on top of the podcast. Sure. Yeah. I'll, I can, I can send you the, the link for the modular grid stuff. Um, well, as, like I said before, one, one main goal for me now is to write music on, on the modular and the system that I put together now kind of, yeah, it just takes all of the experience that I've gained over the last 13 years and, puts it into this context where I wanted to create a system that allowed me to perform really elaborate arrangements and also live. Uh, not to say I would drag the system out and play live with it, but I mean like live video performances and stuff. Um, so it's really based, it's based around that mostly and having numerous voices. It's 20 channels. I have two, two WMD performance mixers nice. with the expander. So it's a total of 20 channels um, and then, you know, the two nerd seeks are working together, which give you basically 12 tracks and then four sample tracks additionally, if I wanted them. So it's quite a lot of stuff. And then factoring in the, the analog rhythm on top of that and kind of building some of the drum voices from, from that. I can, there's nothing I really feel like I can't do with this system. And that's, that's kind of what, you know, was, was the thing, the, the thought behind it. The, a lot of people ask me why I have it all symmetrically organized. That's more of a mental thing and a signal flow thing. Being an audio engineer, I always think about signal flow in the back of my mind. And it's like cemented in my brain, the top to bottom, left to right kind of format of signal flow in a professional studio is what I tried to adapt to the modular. And it, doesn't work exactly the same way, but it's mostly just mentally for me, 
I try to compartmentalize everything so that it, there's a certain structure to it. As where, like you said, that there's no rhyme or reason for you. It's just kind of chaotic and you like that aspect of it. For me, the way my brain works is, and I think it may be due to some mild form of OCD or whatever, but I have to have everything very structured and organized in order to sort of transcend the technical elements of what I'm working on and kind of think about it more creatively. I, everything technical has to be very sort of streamlined in, in that in that way so that I don't get hung up on that aspect of it. And that gives gives me the ability to have a mental map of any kind of complex patch. I wish I could turn the camera right now, but my screen is wall mounted. Hmm. The way that I have everything set up allows me to have a mind map of every imaginable scenario of how a patch can be set up. And I think that that is very complex in itself, but allowing me to have the ability to not have to think about the like intricacies of a patch and have more of a hierarchical sort of overview of it. Um, I, I'm, I'm finding it difficult to articulate, but basically it's a mental thing. Uh, and, and, and the way that I have it organized is all about being able to transcend the complexities of the possibilities of what could happen with this modular and just actually like looking at it more from the top down. I like that. I think uh, that that obsession with order, I hear that in your music too. So I, I get it. Because uh, everything I've heard from you is, is very structured in a, in, a, in a meticulous way. And I, I appreciate that aspect. Um, Thank you. So now my question is, so your modular is, is performance oriented for you. Um, are your modular tracks multi-tracked? Do you do a lot of post with them or is it just jam and go? It's uh, mostly just jam and go. And the reason for that is uh, because I, I find that it pushes me to be a little bit more creative in the moment. If I were multi-tracking things and then I had everything in stems in the computer, I think it would lead me in this direction where I would overthink things and kind of, it takes in my mind some of the artistry out of being able to do things on the modular, but also, uh, you know, it doesn't lend itself well to live performance. At some point I want to play shows again. And if I had the opportunity to sort of fix everything in the computer by multi-tracking, uh, I think I would be, you know, kind of set, selling, setting my, what's the term? Selling myself short. Yeah. Um, because I wouldn't necessarily be as good live. So it's kind of in the interest of becoming really, really tight in real time that I don't multi-track anything. And I just go stereo out of my modular into the interface and just record everything that's going on and worry about mixing all the elements within the actual modular itself. Nice, I, nice. I do, I do a little bit of uh, post on the two track just to bring up the, the levels and kind of tighten everything up, but it's super minimal, nothing even worth mentioning. It's just some compression basically. Okay. Um, What's your go-to compressor? Well, I, you know, I use the, the fab filter stuff a lot for that. Um, let me let me look right now because I have a little session set up, and I don't have like a big elaborate chain. I think everybody maybe expects that I have like some special mastering chain. I literally just have uh, the Pro L two on the master bus of an Ableton Live session, and then I put a little bit of uh, compression, just the regular Ableton Live compressor, on on the actual track itself. So it's those two things. That's it. I feel that. <laughs> that's that's I, me too for yeah, all my I, demos. I just don't I, I feel like people really over and maybe it's just this is my opinion. I think that should just be the disclaimer about everything I've said. But um I hear all these people talking about all of these nuanced things about different characteristics of outboard processors and this and that. And I've been doing this for a long time, and I have to tell you, a lot of those nuances are negligible in my opinion. I mean, yes, 
there's the whole thing about adding certain bits of character. And yes, I can hear the difference in the nuances that a lot of these different processors bring to the table and so on and so forth. But most people that are listening to your stuff are not audio engineers. They're not listening for those nuances. They're completely irrelevant and negligible to that audience. So are you making the music for your audio engineering buddies or is it not that important what preamp you used or whether you could get one more db of gain out of this thing or you know what i mean and i've become more and more into that concept that like at the end of the day it's what you're doing the creative core of what you're doing that actually you know resonates with people and it's more important to focus on that than it is about on, on all of the little minute details of what you could do from an audio engineering standpoint, uh, because those things aren't always going to be there for you. When you're playing a live show, you're, you're maybe, you know, the victim of a shitty sound guy or a bad system and you still have to kick ass and do your thing and not be, uh, you know, debilitated by that by those elements you know that is better than anyone playing <laughs> live shows you don't know what you're going to be what you're going to walk into so you have to be tight and you have to be ready for anything you have to be ready for people breathing you know down your neck or you have to be ready for awkwardness or any anything so it's like are you going to worry about getting that extra little character out of your special little piece of gear that's going to make your stuff sound good you got to be able to 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 bring it on in, in under any circumstances on the crappiest gear possible. hundred percent feel that like, it's not about the price of the gear. It's also, it's like, if you're searching that hard for character, maybe your music lacks character. Just well, right. Right. Um, and, and that's an unfortunate kind of, it's a very honest, you know, statement. And I com- couldn't agree more. It, you know, I'll, I won't name names, but a friend of mine, a number of years back, and this is only one example. I've dealt with this. I still deal with this constantly. People asking me about what gear to get, what's the best this and the best that. Well, my friend, this example, my friend was shopping for a vocal mic and but the budget wasn't really an issue. So he was looking at $3,000 mics and you name it. And meanwhile, his vocals are absolutely horrifically terrible. And I'm thinking to myself, like, what does it matter what mic you get? You could literally record on a SM58 and be fine because your skills don't support what this, you know, thing that you've, you've sensationalized, this equipment that you need isn't going to make your music any better. A lot of people fall into that category where they think that some other piece of equipment is going to, take them in a new direction or make their stuff better. And in some cases that's true because new gear does inspire us. And it, you know, all those things, obviously <laughs> you and I know that, but I also think the other side of it is if you can't already do something with what you have, then you should maybe focus more on polishing your skills or, you know, like that, than acquiring more equipment that's just going to, be more and more of a distraction and kind of, t- you know, I, I just think too many people fall into that where they have to have the best or, you know, what's the best? I hear that all the time. What's the best thing to get? And I think that comes from people wanting to get the best bang for their buck and stuff. And I get that, but it's like, well, why do you need the best? Are you the best? Right? Like who is the best? <laughs> Right, right. Yeah. Like, what, what, what does the best mean? <laughs> like, what? Let's hear your music. You know, what? That's the other thing. Like, I hear a lot of opinions about things, and then it's like you go look at their YouTube or SoundCloud, and their music's atrocious. And it's like they have all these opinions about technical, you know, nuances of things. And it's like it doesn't. Anyway, I could go on and on about this, but the bottom line is, I think people overthink it, and for the modular, for me. It's all about just making it as great as I possibly can sonically and creatively and then just capturing that moment. And I get a lot of uh, enjoyment out of that. And I hopefully will be able to share that with people more and more as I start diving into that realm again 
after a number of years of kind of pressing pause on it. Well, I'm excited to hear what you bring out and you should send me some demos when you want some feedback or just send me them anyway, because I want to hear them. Um, and I have a couple of addendums to what we were just talking about. Uh, the one being that the modular itself is such an instrument full of character and life that it doesn't need much as long as you have a decent mix. So if you're not multi-tracking, it's like, well, you got the mix right. The vibe is already there, you know? Uh, right. And then the second one is that like we live in such a, this is the golden age for gear. You know, you got all the old shit, you got new shit, and everything sounds good. It's not like, you know, 1989 where you could only afford a Fostex 4-track that had, you know, 20 dB of noise in every channel. You right. know, like, like I've been in pro studios. I've used like a Neve console, SSL, Midas, you know, API, all the top fucking desks. And I, I would hear engineers talk like, oh, like the Neve sound and the, the, you know, the API sound. In this record, it sounds so great because it was done on NSSL. And like, I, I understand that those things certainly help things sound really good. But if you're using a Neve, if you're using an SSL, if, or let's take it to audio interfaces, like if you're using a Focusrite, if you're using a Behringer, if you're using a Motu, like that is already better than what anyone had to record at home with in 1992. Exactly, and, and like it's 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 not that one is significantly better. It's just different flavors. Like I don't know why I would want an eleven seventy six over an LA two A over you know a fucking drummer nineteen seventy three. Other than that, they have slightly different functionality. Like the sound quality is kind of the same. Right. You know, it's not right. one isn't going to make your track gold out of nowhere. Yeah. Well, and yeah, and 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 you're not going to hear it in an isolated way. And yeah. even so, then you take the percentage of people that are going to hear it. How many, how many people in that group are even even give a shit? Exactly. <laughs> you know what I mean. So, so it's a lot of this overthinking of stuff. And and yeah, you make a really great point. I I just been trying because I've I've been guilty of it too. And lately, I've been working my way away from that concept and just. Uh, you know, people are surprised because I've been interviewed before and people ask me about, you know, what what's your favorite compressor and stuff? And it's like, my answers are never that exciting because it doesn't really matter to me. Like, I sure, I have certain things I like and certain things I would like to have. I'd love to have, and I probably will buy a bunch of outboard gear soon and whatever. But I always wrestle with that because I'm like, I can already get good sounds, especially now with the Apollo. There's some incredible emulations of vintage stuff and stuff that would be $30,000 for me to buy. I already have it. Do I need to really have that extra 0.5% of character that I would get out of the real piece of hardware that would justify spending $5,000 on it? Or can I just use the one I already have? What's the end goal for me anyway? It's just to record my music or sound effects and then, you know, get the, like, I can already do that at an incredibly high quality with everything that I have. So what, what is it? You know what I mean? Totally. I, I've been afraid to jump into the universal audio thing. Cause I know I'm going to spend two grand on plugins right away. Like I was, yeah. I did, I did a record with uh, David Bottrell, who's produced tool smashing pumpkins and placebo, just to name a few. And, he was telling me he, that he mixed an entire Rush live album on his laptop with only UAD plugins and that it blew Rush's mind. And like, okay, Rush has no relation to what I'm doing, but they certainly right. know about audio engineering, right? And, and so that was such an endorsement for me that I was like, I cannot buy this because <laughs> yeah. I will have no money. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah it, it's one of those things. But if you, if you look at it in comparison to what it would cost to buy all the boxes in the form of hardware, then it's yeah. a pretty economical choice. But that's the, that's the thing. We're also at a place now with technology where it's evolved to a point where the whole analog versus digital argument is becoming kind of an old, you know, outdated concept. Like it, it, the software really does sound exceptionally good. And for guys like us that already make, abstract noisy shit as it is like you think that 
it's really relevant to nitpick the differences between this like you know vintage pro audio gear it really isn't I, or if it is it's not there's nothing wrong with being a gearhead and like nerding out about the, those things and those nuances and hearing them and having your own preference i'm not downplaying any of that but for me it's just kind of become like a waste of energy because you know, I've spent so much time obsessing about equipment and all those details that it's actually taken me away from the creative elements of what I do. And that to me is a, like, uh, you know, a problem <laughs> because I, I spend more time in the past on modular grid rearranging my system or the, whatever system was going on at the time than I actually did making patches. I feel that uh, it's 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 very easy to get bogged down in that. It's like just make the tracks, like just right. jam. Right. And I, I I mean to that end, what you do is inherently a different approach than what I do, and I want to get more into that eventually as well, where I do longer sessions and I just kind of start a patch and just see where it goes and sort of jam. Um, because you, like you said earlier, a lot of the stuff that I do is very calculated and precise, but I want to start getting, uh, a little bit more spontaneous with it as well, because I think that there's something really cool and fun about that. And I really enjoy listening to your jams and how they sort of evolve over time. And oh. that's, that's lacking in my, in my music because of my approach. But it also has to do with the fact that, like, my space is so confined here. I can't, and I don't really have, like, people to hang with, <laughs> like, you know, where I, I'm very family-oriented. I don't really have, like, a social life these days, so it's mostly just me and my family. And because of where we live, too, I no longer live in San Francisco, so I don't have this whole, like, community of people. And then, of course, you factor COVID in. So it's basically just me and my studio, and... You know, that's not, it's not as fun to like jam or whatever when I don't, you know, you have like your girlfriend with you or other people roll through because you're in Berlin in a city where there's a lot of stuff happening. It's a different vibe. Like for me, I don't have that social component of it. And so it doesn't, it's not as inviting to approach my music in the more kind of jam free form kind of way. Mm. I mean, I feel that for me, it was mostly like a laziness thing. Uh, cause I did so many, uh, like my first three albums when I was singing and writing songs, they're like extremely meticulously cut together, you know, creating weird sounds and then arranging them on the grid and logic. And then later Ableton and, and spending like, you know, having like 96 channel sessions in Ableton and stuff. And it, it was such, I, I exhausted myself. Like I, I can't deal with this shit anymore. And then right around 2013 is when I started getting into techno. Yeah. You know, before that it was industrial IDM and whatever right. else. And then, uh, then I was like, wow, this music is, is really, uh, it's, it's simple, but it's more meditative. And, you know, you don't need to have a million glitch edits every five seconds because you have ADD. It's like, you know, it evolves slowly over time. And then maybe even I was smoking way too much weed that, that, that stuff get, started giving me anxiety. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I was like, I need calm, slow right. evolution. It completely right. changed my mind. Um, so I don't know. Now, now, now I do a couple edits here and there, but it's like, I just, I don't know. It's like, it's so much quicker to just do the, the way I'm doing it that I don't know if I could go back. Maybe that's bad to be lazy like that, but it's just more fun. It's, it's, like it should just be fun for me. I don't know. I don't have the patience. Right. And and that's a that's a, an excellent point. At the end of the day, it's like what 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 are you doing this for? And if it's for, you know, part of what you're doing it for is for your own enjoyment, then why make it miserable, you know? Yeah. And 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 also I think it's really cool to be able to approach modular or like making music in this way that you do because it's more conducive to being really good at playing live. Um, you know, guys that can do really long sessions like you or like Colin Benders or whatever, like guys like that, that have showcased that uh, are inherently going to be more versatile when it comes to playing shows than guys like me who have to have the song structure and everything. 
And that's why I'm putting more effort now into jamming and kind of taking a different approach so that when it comes time for me to play shows again, um, I can be more spontaneous and be more flexible and, and not have everything have to be so rigid. I mean, think of it, it's, it's a bit like jazz in a way, like you show up with your instrument and you just start playing along with whatever else is going on, be it with another person or with your own mind. Like, you know, I think of it more like free jazz than I do uh, writing a song. But I'm not saying, uh, like, I think your approach is really cool and you make really dope stuff. So there's there's merit to both. I'm just too lazy. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I hear you. And I, I, I'm not going to stop doing things the way that I do. I just want to expand it a bit and mm. see where that takes me. Kind of like you did, but the opposite direction. Mm. Maybe try downers instead of uppers. I don't know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> totally, though. Uh, I remember when I did my second album called Tension Strategies, I... Uh, um, was still taking medicine for my ADHD. So I was like super tense all the time and it was like <laughs> hyper edited. <laughs> and when I stopped that, I was like, man, I'm too slow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Those kinds of things are a trip, aren't they? How yeah. our personalities and our sort of dispositions seep into our music and our approach of how to, how to be creative and express ourselves. It's a trip. Yeah. Man, I think I, uh, used up all my questions. Um, but this was really cool. So thank you for cool. being, thank you for your candor. Good, sir. Absolutely. It was really great to chat with you. I'm glad we finally did it. And um, more importantly, I'm really excited to get together in person. So we'll, we'll chat about that, you know, separately. But next year, this year, I'm just spending time kind of get, getting a bunch of content done. Obviously, I do Glitch Machine stuff on, on, the, on a daily basis keeping that going, but my goal is to put myself out there a little bit more again and get more music stuff going and release more music and play some shows. So hopefully we'll, our paths will cross quite a bit going forward in that domain. I hope they do. And I'm excited for you to re-enter uh, things for lack of a better word. We need more of you around here. Thanks, man. I appreciate it, Joey. Thanks for watching. Glitch Machines is going to be offering 50% off of any product you buy on their site for two weeks after the date of this video is posted. I'll post the, the uh, code in the description. I want to say thanks to Evo for coming on and thanks to him for being one of the first people to get me to do professional sound work. I love Glitch Machines products. He makes crazy sounds. The plugins do amazing stuff. The circuit bit devices were cool back in the day when I first heard of them and I hope I convince him to do more hardware. Anyway, if you'd like to know who's coming up on the podcast next, you can do that by subscribing to my Patreon. Peace out.